Jane Johnston, the Panther Outreach Specialist with Florida Fish and Wildlife, and I was uh, hired to help people know what to do about living with panthers, because if you're in Collier County, these are certainly your neighbors, right? All you guys are Collier County folks. So I have a little bit of a map. I usually start out with where I'm talking, so in the top left corner, uh, that's where we're at, and I have a little bit of telemetry data from 2015 and 2016 of one of our collared panthers. So you can see you don't have to drive very far uh, to encounter panther activity. So every one of those green dots is where he showed up? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Is that one panther or a certain many panthers? Yep, that's one. Well, and one panther that has visited all those spots. Right. So and you can util see where they're utilizing a lot of the green spaces in between all the development. And you can access this kind of data. We do publish it on our website. So. Uh, under the quick maps section. You can take a look at it and then you can see out further east a lot more of those green dots show up. So we'll talk a little bit about what is a Florida panther. So the genus is Puma and its species is Concolor. This species of Florida panther is Corii. So Charles Bernard Corey is the scientist that looked at uh, different skeletons and skulls of other Pumas around North America and discovered that ours had some different types of morphological features, which are physical traits that were different from the other Pumas um, around North America, and that's how it ended up being named after him. So this is, this is our species. This picture was taken out at Dinner Island Ranch, if you guys haven't visited out there, it's a pretty neat space, so by one of our partners, the F-Stop Foundation. Pumas are an American cat. Uh, this is the current puma distribution. So on the left, they are North Central and South American cats. And in the green, that's their current distribution. You can see in Florida, very small green area. There's 32 subspecies of pumas. They live in different types of habitats. They have different morphological features. Um, on the right, there's 15 subspecies in North America. Uh, you can see where in the Northeastern area, is anybody from the Northeast? Yeah, originally, yes, me too. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a bad thing. Most of us came from somewhere else because, yeah. you know, we love it here. But, yep, so the, the species there is uh, considered extinct. Um, so what, what do you have instead? You have a lot of deer up there. Uh, the yellow part, that's the uh, range for uh, Corii, for the subspecies. I'm going to take a picture of that. All right, no problem. Uh, this, the subspecies range, this is a little bit of a closer look. So the historic range was all the states in the blue, including a little bit of southern Tennessee and South Carolina. Uh, the red is the current range. So as development happened in the southeastern United States, the uh, panther population can continue to be compressed into the area that you now see in the red. And that's the current distribution. What type of timing? You say historically, how far, how, how long ago did they have a range that large? Uh, well, furthest back as the 1800s, because as development happened, there were uh, bounties that the government would pay to have um, panthers killed. So, yeah. So that's uh, that affected their population quite a bit, especially in the more and more people started to settle this area. What does the yellow band represent? Yeah, it's a good question. The yellow band, it's very straight line, but that really is where the Clusahatchee River and the St. Lucie River uh, meet Lake Okeechobee. And the, the reason that we have the line on there, the Clusahatchee River and the St. Lucie River were not historically connected to Lake Okeechobee until later 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so what would happen during our dry season and wet season, because if you guys live in Florida now, you know we only have two seasons, and in the winter it gets really dry here. <coughs> so the Caloosahatchee River, there was a watershed there, but there was dry land where panthers were able to easily move back and forth between the northern parts of Florida and the southern parts of Florida. So when those rivers were channeled, um, it, it prevented a barrier, kind of created a barrier for the panthers. So that's why we tend to find them more south and north these days. Home ranges for males, it's about 200 square miles, which is a lot of space. Males can um, share territory, they uh, exercise mutual avoidance, but they don't want to be in the same territory. If they do encounter each other, uh, they may fight to the death over it, so, but typically they just try to avoid each other. As far as females, um, they're able to have a little bit of a smaller range. They can also tolerate being with their siblings or mother-daughter groups, uh, and they'll, you end up with several females inside of one male's range, you know, typically. So but you can see where in the male range they s overlap, but they use scrapes to identify their ranges, so they use their back feet to pile some dirt and some leaves, and then they urinate or defecate on it in order to mark their territory, uh, which is how they mutually avoid each other. So. Do you know this because of collars? Yes, 
yeah, this data is collected from collared panthers. Their physique, so the average uh, adults, 60 to 160 pounds. The male average is about 130. Um, I brought a male specimen today. He was unfortunately hit by a car out in the Clewiston area. Uh, he was about 155 pounds uh, when he was hit by a vehicle. Females average 80 pounds, so while he's a little bit on the higher scale of weight, she's actually a little bit lower, 60 pounds, and she was pregnant when she was hit by a vehicle. So, yep, so, and that's how I have all my specimens today. We'll talk a little bit about that. So they're about four and a half feet long. They have a pretty long tail. It's almost as long as their bodies, and they stand about two and a half feet high. The tan fur is really important, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide, but it can be a reddish tan or to a golden tan type of color. They do have some black markings on the back of their ears. Important to see the back of the ears of a panther are different from a bobcat. Bobcats have a little bit of a white patch there too, but the panther ears are gonna be completely black. Uh, tip of the tail is black, and then they have some black facial markings too. The kittens, however, are spotted, and they have blue eyes. So they do keep those spots until about six months old. They may lose them. Some of them we've seen keep on a year and a half up to two years old. But yes, mistaken identities. I do uh, get asked pretty frequently at events and other talks that I give about black panthers. And there are no black panthers. Florida panthers are not black. There are other animals referred to as black panthers like the jaguar and the leopard. Uh, they can come in black colors. And then we have found black bobcats and black coyotes in Florida. So that's an entirely possible. And even black house cats have been misidentified as black panthers. So figure that uh, animals, particularly active in the evening hours, you usually don't get a really good look at them. They don't stand under a light for you. Reproduction, so it takes about the males about three years to be uh, able to reproduce and the females about one and a half years. They do breed year round here in Florida. Uh, it takes about three months for gestation to occur where they give birth. They do like to have their dens under saw palmetto thickets, so the female makes a big enough space for her and the kittens to be able to stay in there. Kittens will stay with her inside the den until they're about two months old and then she'll start introducing them to her territory. Uh, they have average two to three kittens. They can have as little as one or up to four. Uh, you know, total. And then they disperse around nine months to a year and a half. So when the kittens are about the mom's size and they're about this age, that's when they'll depart. So seeing, if you ever hear about stories about seeing multiple cats, it's going to be typically the mother with her kittens, even though they look as big as she is. Natural life expectancy, this is if nothing else happens to our Florida panther. Uh, male, it's about 10 years. Females, it's about 15. So males live a little bit. Males live less than the females, so if you think about in terms of reproduction, the males are only reproductive for about six years of their natural lives, and females are reproductive about twice that long. Is the, is the tenure a genetic thing that males uh, just live less, less uh, shorter than females, or is it because males have a lot of aggression and are killing each other so often? That's a possibility, yeah. They have a different, little bit of a different type of lifestyle in the female. I mean, their ranges are larger, and yes, they can encounter other, they move around a lot more, they encounter other males, see? So, yeah, other things get to them, they age. Are they solitary, or do they pair up? Yeah, so um, panthers are mostly solitary, particularly the, the males. The times that you'll see them paired up with a female for reproduction, they're probably together for about a week. But otherwise, that they're, yeah, otherwise, that, they're by themselves. Yeah, and after he mates with her, he's also not helping her raise the kittens. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> That's a good question. Food, they're carnivores. Deer and hogs make up their primary diet. However, they will eat other things, um, armadillos and raccoons and so other small mammals, and unfortunately, they will eat things that belong to people, pets that belong to us, livestock that belongs to us. Um, so, see, we have a long list of some interesting things that have unfortunately been eaten at people's homes. So even alpacas and at wallabies, which are like kangaroos. So we have a long list of these animals. If it's, unfortunately, if it's made of meat, a panther will eat it. They are an umbrella species, um, so they're an apex predator. There isn't anything that predates them except us, of course, which is no longer 
legal to do um, in the keystone species. So if you end up eliminating the Florida panther from the environment, from the habitat, then there are other issues that start to happen uh, below there of the other animals that they eat. So we talked about a little bit in the Northeast, you no longer have puma up there, you have a lot of deer instead, which creates a whole other set of issues of its own. So with ecosystems, you know, if you remove any element of it, you alter any element of it, it changes how it works, how it behaves. So um, I know a lot of people don't like hogs, so if you can imagine if we didn't have a Florida panther, how many more hogs there would be? Some people don't like those. <laughs> and, they're, and they're pretty invasive, so. This is the first time I'm hearing umbrella species. Really? Can you define? Yeah, so um, they, what it means is that it's a species that supports a bunch of other species underneath it. So, uh, and it's the combination of their being at the top and the other ones being underneath that make the ecosystem work in the way that it does. Does that make sense? Sure, thank you. Okay. Yeah, question? What's the green underneath the, the acorn? Uh, yeah, some acorns. So wow. you have turkeys that eat acorns and they spread seed. And so there would be habitat alteration. If you had an overabundance of turkeys, then you would end up with a different type of habitat <coughs> if you had more oak trees being. Yeah, that's okay. No worries. Florida panther is an endangered species. So we talked a little bit about, we were asking about what was impacting their, you know, why did they get compressed in southwest Florida, uh, you know, prior to the 1950s, you could hunt them. There were, wasn't any re really regulation on them. Uh, even earlier in the 1900s and the 1800s, people were paid to actually kill them. So, but by 1950, they were declared a game species to try to give them some protections. So the number that you could get, the limits in the season were regulated, but it didn't take very long. In 1958, they were listed as endangered by the state of Florida. Uh, in 67, the U.S. listed them as endangered. And then with the, with the inception of the Endangered Species Act, they were then listed as an endangered species in 1973, and they've been on that list ever since. So a little bit about the Endangered Species Act and the Florida Panther. So the Endangered Species Act is to help animals not go extinct. That's the purpose of it. So they identify animals that are on the verge of extinction, and then they receive federal protections. And a lot of the work then is implemented through the state agencies in order to recover the species. So they set different types of recovery plans um, and usually they're related to some kind of number. You know, they're trying to reach a target. What's a sustainable population? So endangered is their current status. Um, we do keep track of their population counts. Uh, the best we can do is estimate them because they're such solitary creatures. You know, they don't get easily counted and they have very large ranges. But we use a lot of public lands for this purpose. So Big Cypress and Fakahatchee, Picayune, you can find panthers on all these properties and some private lands. Uh, so their population estimate was upgraded and the, the low number is 120, but there could be as many as 230 adults and sub-adults uh, out there. Uh, Sub-adults are those that have uh, left their mothers, but they're not of reproductive age yet. So. The next step is after they are come off the endangered list, they go to the threatened list, which means they've met some kind of recovery. In the case of the Florida panther, uh, they have to have at least two distinct populations of 240 adults or sub-adults to take, be taken off the endangered list and put on the threatened species list. Well, we don't yet even have one population of 240, so we have, we have some work to be done. And I, the reason I put a picture of my manatee here is because they were recently listed from endangered to threatened just this past year because they're starting to reach some of those recovery numbers, some of those recovery goals. And not listed. That's Either you're endangered, threatened, or you don't have to be listed at all under the Endangered Species Act. Though, and I have a picture of an American alligator because it is no longer an endangered species, but it's still protected by the state of Florida. So um, important, some people sometimes wonder if, okay, so if we reach recovery, then what happens? Well, it's still a protected animal. That's what happens, because we don't want to get back to the point where we have to recover it from, from the brink of extinction. So given our current population estimates and the growth, um, which is very slow, we were down to about 20 to 30 panthers back in the early 1990s, and we're up to 120 to 230. Um, we have a little ways to go. We also have to get other states to be able to have populations there too. Yes? With so much development in southwest Florida, mm -hmm. is it reasonable to think that, though, that we would have enough open space for a male to have 200 square miles? And is there enough for that? Well, we know that males ex are here and that they do, but 
what it also means, and one of the reasons for my talk today, is that they're utilizing space where, we're, where we've already developed. They're utilizing space where we live. So because they're particularly in the Golden Gate Estates area, there's a lot of natural space still available for them, plus they're uh, adjacent to public lands. So yeah, now we expect that that range will need to expand, of course, as the population grows, because yes, males are gonna need to seek out the, uh, different areas. And we have had some males leave Southwest Florida. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. I'm sure the fire is affected. Well, if, so fire would affect them as far as if their, their prey is going to move, they move. So now then fire burns through, vegetation recovers pretty quickly, and as soon as the deer return, panther may return, of course they do like to be able to have cover. So, but yeah, it could cause some movement, but because their ranges are so large, they probably went to a different part of their range because the entire range wouldn't necessarily be burnt. So, yeah. But what's impacting it? So we've talked habitat loss is one of the things that's still impacting the panther's ability because of course they like the same places we like to live. They like to be in pine uplands and hardwood hammocks. <laughs> and that's also where we like to build, you know, our houses, schools, businesses. Um, so that's one of the factors. Introduce diseases, feline leukemia. Feral cats are domestic cats that are diseased. Um, panthers do eat them. And if they have feline leukemia virus, then the panther then contracts the virus and it also dies. So always encourage people to have your pets vaccinated. Keep them inside and secure. It's always a good one too. Can panthers be vaccinated against that? <laughs> if you could get them, I don't know. I don't know that you could do that. That would be very, that would be a little more difficult. A lot easier to get domestic cats. Or, well, about feral cats vaccinated, so yeah. It's a good. It's a good question. Tranquilize them like they do in Africa. Give them a shot. Yeah. So some of the challenges um, with being able to capture and uh, collar panthers and anesthetize them for those purposes, if we wanted to vaccinate them, is having access to them because they're in such a wide space and they're on some private lands. Why can't they vaccinate them when they caught with the collars on them? That's a good question. I will find out and I will answer that question at the end. They're there, mm -hmm. right? Can't they give them a shot? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll answer that. I'll answer that question at the end. So, okay. That, that, oh, good, good questions. You guys are bringing good questions. Um, inbreeding uh, is one of the other things that impacted the population, particularly when they were down to t the number of 20 and 30, because then you started to have um, family related, uh, panthers related, you know, reproducing with each other you know, uh, parents with, with offspring, siblings, that kind of stuff. So some of the evidence of that outwardly was the cowlick, which on the female mount, you can see where her fur is sticking up and also kinked tails where it would, only, it would be a little crook. I have a picture of it on one of my banners. And, but inwardly what was happening is they would end up with a hole in their heart, which uh, made it in, almost impossible to reproduce. And they, for, of course they didn't live very long either as a result. Uh, and for males, uh, their testes wouldn't descend, you know, or they may lack testes, so they weren't able to reproduce either. So that's some of the evidence that we knew that inbreeding was occurring. And yeah, so, and we'll talk about how, how do we fix that? Illegal killing. Um, on the bottom right is a picture of a gentleman that shot a Florida panther in Georgia in 2008. So when I talked about, we do have males that will move out of the area because they need to disperse. They need to find other places. <laughs> of course, they're not necessarily what's that females where they're going, but traveled all the way up to Georgia, um, was shot by the hunter. Unfortunately, you know, it is illegal to shoot a Florida panther, even if it's not in Florida. Uh, I'm sure he, he didn't know at the time it was a Florida panther, but he wasn't permitted to be able to shoot a large cat. So uh, they were able to do a DNA recovery on the cat and find out that it was a Florida panther. So uh, penalties for um, harming, hurting, harassing, shooting, of course, killing a panther, uh, could be up to $100,000 in a couple years in jail, so it can be pretty severe. And vehicles, so I mentioned today that all my mounts uh, were hit by cars. That's how I got them. But not to end on a sad note, yes, question? Uh, what about pythons? What impact do they have? It's a good question that I don't know that we know the answer to yet. I imagine we'll find out as time goes on. So they do compete for the same of course, because there is proof that pythons eat deer. So of course that's competing for the same food that panthers rely on. So that we know, but as far as anything else, we don't know yet, but I'm sure time will tell on that one.
the more we learn about pythons. Well, do you know anything now? Just that, that they compete for the for the prey sources, but I don't know that we know much more than that. Yeah. yeah. Do uh, panthers eat pythons or vice versa? If they do, we're unaware of it. So, yeah. yeah. Have found any pythons yet with panthers in, in their bellies? Uh, no. <laughs> Not that I've heard about. <laughs> so, but I. Not to, not to get off track too much on a bad note, that's why I want to uh, bring us back to the recovery efforts. So genetic restoration was one of the things we were able to do to get the population to increase from the 20 to 30 then to the 120 to 230 that we have now. Um, what they did was uh, back in uh, the mid 90s, eight female Texas cougars were introduced into the ecosystem uh, with collars on and mated with our resident male panthers. And after a sufficient number of litters uh, were produced, then they were recaptured and sent back. Um, I do get asked the question about if female uh, Texas cougars are still out here, but no, because that was a long time ago, and the natural life expectancy. They Why would, did they send them back? Because uh, we, we no longer needed them. We, they had a sufficient number of yeah, yeah, and it was just, and it was, it was only females, so it wasn't the males. And we, of course, the offspring stayed here. We didn't send the offspring back, so, so that's helped a lot. It's gone a long way. Habitat preservation. Uh, there's been quite a bit of this mitigation. So you asked about all, a lot of the development. Um, development in panther habitat usually requires some kind of, of compromise between the developers and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So conservation easements, and that uh, falls under. People with large private acreage um, are able to set aside usually about a third of their lands for natural spaces and be compensated by the state of Florida for doing that. So that helps not only the panther, but of course all the other native species that we have here that are under the same duress as the panther. Uh, and publicly held lands, and that's a lot where we do our, our studies with panthers on Big Cypress and Everglades and the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge. So encourage you guys to visit any of those spaces if you have a chance. And, and underpasses. So if vehicles are killing a lot of panthers, you know, what can you do about that? Underpasses, um, much easier to install, you know, pre-putting the road in, to go back and retrofit roads for it, a little bit more difficult, mostly cost prohibitive, but it, it can happen. There's a picture of an underpass there. They do work. It's the combination of the underpasses and the fencing together. Um, and then they, they do um, some landscaping to attract panther prey to those areas, and then that way the panthers will follow. So there is a new way that they're trying to look at underpasses, because you notice that when we're driving on roads, we pass over a lot of water. So there's been some work done to put some shelving in as another additional pathway, and preliminarily it looks like it's gonna work. So only a long-term study in time will tell if that's a, a better permanent solution. I don't understand the shelving. Yeah, so with a waterway, and they're able to, to put a bank right next to it to where it's enough space for animals to crawl underneath. Thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome. So panthers have been documented in three of the five FWC regions. And so even though we know a panther, there's a little asterisk all the way at the top, uh, made it all the way to Georgia. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not in the other regions. It can turn up anywhere in the state. Uh, but we have to have concrete proof of that. It has to be panther photo or panther tracks, and we have to be able to verify where it was taken. Um, but we do now have documented two females and kittens north of the Closatchee River. So we have not had a proof of a female north of the river since 1973. Why not more south, or is that just all marshland? Well, the, the Everglades have a, a mix of different types of ecosystems, and so panthers still want to be in the pine, hardwood hammocks and pine uplands areas, and so it tends to get a little bit more wet down there. So, so panther population growing, our population also growing, and it creates an opportunity, additional opportunities for there to be interactions between mm. humans and panthers. So the Florida Panther Response Plan was created in anticipation of these opportunities and what can you do? There are things that can be done. So uh, we want to do, uh, promote public safety, uh, but also be able to still conserve the panther. So this is mostly about us. The response team consists of a collection of people from different agencies. Uh, they meet once a year. Uh, they report to the Senior Level Oversight Committee, which is on my next slide, and they produce an annual report, which you can find on our website if you're interested in, in reading it. There's a lot of good information in there. It uh, talks about different types of uh, human-panther interactions. 
and another thing's going on in the world of panthers. So from each agency, you have a representative as a panther biologist, law enforcement, and public information officer. Um, then the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we also have a ref one of the refuge managers and a panther coordinator, which ties everything together as the liaison. So we coordinate with uh, federal agencies as well as state agency. And then the oversight committee, it's a little higher level oversight over all the activities of the response team. And that's a little bit of a higher level. You can see with the superintendent of Big Cypress and Everglades, the manager for the National Wildlife Refuge, and the director. And these folks oversee everything that the, the team does. So now about the Florida response plan. So this is all about human panther interactions and classified five ways uh, going from the lowest risk to the highest risk. So it's sighting encounter, incident, threat, and attack. And Depredations is separate and is considered a type of human and panther interaction, um, but it's not direct. Usually, it's, if it's a panther has unfortunately eaten something that belongs to you, uh, you probably didn't encounter the panther directly, but that's like an in between. And then outreach, that's me. That's what I'm doing today. <laughs> Have there been any panther attacks number five up there? No recorded and verified attacks of a panther on a human. So. And hopefully, I'm educating people enough and it won't happen. <laughs> Tell you what to do. Um, sighting is low risk. So uh, this is just a visual observation. It's a fleeting glimpse. You can see uh, the gentleman there in the picture. He's, he's taking a picture. He's in the picture, taking a picture of a panther uh, that's walking away. And so we consider verified uh, records as photo evidence of the panther. Uh, or tracks, so otherwise it's unverified if we can't find the physical evidence that you saw the panther. Um, panther behavior should be that retreats at the sight of humans, displays a lack of attention. You can see how that one's looking away, but kind of looking back to see what's going on. He's kind of, I want to see where you're at while I walk away. That, that's to be expected. Did you guys uh, take a look at this next one? Did you guys see the video out of Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary oh, yeah. with the lady and the yeah? So yeah, and that's kind of. Interesting. Somebody, yeah. Well, it looked like they were both terrified of each other, honestly. Yeah. That's, that's what I thought was most hilarious about it. They were equally terrified of each other, which is, and that's what you would expect. So, um, but uh, talking about how panthers like pine uplands and hardwood hammocks probably didn't want to get in the water and get its feet wet, so they utilize boardwalks during the summertime, mostly. So they don't like, they like to avoid wet areas, probably a good chance there was other uh, human activity on that boardwalk that day. So made for a great video. Other places in the country where there have been attacks by, well, they call them mountain lions and cougars there, right. but aren't okay. they basically the same? They, they are puma con color, so they're the same species, Why just a different subspecies. Like bikers? So, uh, one of the things that we'll get to toward the end is what do you do if you encounter a parent? Though? And the number one thing is don't run. So if you are behaving as prey would, which is to run or to be active, uh, or to be going away from a cat, that, that very likely may have you know, caused that type of reaction. I'm sure the person probably didn't see them. You know, well, there was one where there was two bikers and mm -hmm. the, the cougar attacked the biker from behind jumped down on her yeah. while she was biking through. While she's biking, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good question. Um, I'll see if I can find out some more information for you about that. Yes, so an encounter um, is low to moderate risk, and this is a little bit different. So it's unexpected direct meeting. So well, obviously the person that took this picture a little bit closer than the other guy and then this one's sitting and looking at the person instead of walking away. Um, so they'll make some movements that are directed at the human, like this one's looking at the person, but they're unaware and they're not approaching and they're just kind of being curious, they're making eye contact, um, but eventually they should retreat. So what are you supposed to do? Like yes. Make, make a lot of noise, back up? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and yes. Oh, no, if you back up, it's the only thing. So you want to make sure that you maintain eye contact if you walk backwards. But if you can, panthers are scared of people. So whatever you can do for, to reinforce that fear, if you want to yell at them, you want to scream at them, you want to appear larger than they are. Don't turn your back. Don't turn your back, don't run. Yeah, that's important. What's a defensive posture? A defensive posture? Um, 
Yeah. How does that manifest itself? Probably be up on all fours. Yeah. So probably preparing for you because it's still scared of you too. So uh, incident is our next level as a moderate to high risk. It's an interaction uh, between human and panther. So described in the encounter, and then of course there's some additional things that are going on here. They're showing some curiosity. The ears are going to be up. Um, so going to pay more attention to you, and it may shift positions. So uh, intense staring at you, following, hiding from you, but also still watching you, keeping an eye on you. And they don't retreat um, when you take some kind of aggressive or offensive action. So, Threat is considered high risk. It's an unprovoked aggressive or predatory behavior. So I, this is a picture of a mounted, not a panther, but some, a type of cat because I don't have any pictures of this. And hopefully we can continue to go on as long as we can without being able to even take real pictures of these kinds of things. So, but I sometimes think about panthers and if you observe cat behaviors and how they stalk prey and how they behave right before they pounce their prey, or sometimes people. So, small cats, I'm talking about domestic cats. They, they're crouched, they have a twitchy tail, they get their ears back. Um, you know, they're gonna start to exhibit some, some type of behavior as if they're going to attack you. So, and this looks, this will be threatening to you if you saw it from, exhibited from a panther. Uh, they're gonna put their head low to the ground. And they're gonna continue, they're gonna start pumping their back legs like they're getting ready to jump. And then attack is the highest risk and you had asked a question, yes, no verified record of a panther attacking a person and yeah, I, I don't, you love this picture? <laughs> it's really, really professional. But that's because we also do not have a picture of this and hopefully we keep it that way. And this is a direct uh, physical contact between you and a panther. Fight back, of course, that's what we would tell you to do. Fight back. If you've taken all the other steps, though, that should be unnecessary. So the depredations, low risk. Um, it is a panther that preys on domestic pets or livestock. So if something's happened to your pet, usually not while it's with you or attached to you. So I know some people have concerns about walking their pets on a leash and that kind of thing. That's, you just bring your pet closer and exercise the other things that you can do once we get to that slide. Most of the interactions involve depredations. So all of the red graph lines, uh, those are the depredations. You can see how many more of those are happening than some encounters over the years. This is over a 10 year cycle. Uh, incidents, just really showing up in one year there between fiscal year 20, uh, 2010, 2011, that's when we do our reports, uh, typically between July 1st and June 30th, and we're getting ready to make it a calendar year. So. But yeah, and then threat doesn't show up and we, we don't have any place for attack since we don't have a verified record of one. But depredations is always a panther. You know, there are other predators that do live here in Florida with us. It could be dogs and coyotes or bears, bobcats, raccoons, hawks and owls. They all have a different type, a different way that they eat their food and which is why we are able to determine whether it's a panther or maybe other, uh, maybe another animal. Of course, we've got other, other, pre other predators we don't know about yet. So you mentioned the python, of course, that's another one. Um, and non-native species arriving all the time in Florida. <laughs> so we got a lot of those. Uh, sometimes it can be problematic trying to figure out what ate, your, ate the animals because if other animals have also been involved. Best way to know, we have to just know right away. But what can you do? If you have animals that you keep outside, we do have plans available uh, for you to build your own predator-proof enclosure, but you can also get assistance. The Defenders of Wildlife will assist you in advance of you losing an animal. If you want to keep any sheep or goats or chickens or anything outside, if you want some financial assistance to help build a pen, uh, they will provide that for you. If you unfortunately have had something taken by a panther and it's been confirmed by one of our biologists with FWC, then um, you can get additional assistance from the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. Okay, question. Yes, question. I noticed that uh, some of the other predators included bobcats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. bobcats and panthers share territory? Yeah, they share territory, but they're the same kind of thing, mutual avoidance of each other. The bobcat range is a lot smaller, so they're going to be a lot more of them in a neighborhood than you end up with panthers. But yes, they do um, share territory. 
Uh, and something I will note too about these predator-proof enclosures um, to keep in mind about panthers, and of course bobcats being smaller, um, panthers can jump up to 15 feet. So you have to have you have to have a top on top of your, they can dig, and so you wanna make sure they can't dig underneath your enclosure. Uh, you wanna make sure their head can't fit through it. If their head can fit through, the rest of the body can get in there. So they can get in there, they, probably, they may not be able to get out with what they got, but you still don't want them to get in there in the first place. And the one predator this uh, doesn't work for 100% would be bears. Bears uh, respond to electric fence, so you may wanna add that. If you put one of these in there, add some electric fence, it should be pretty good. How does the population of bobcats compare? It's a good question because I don't know um, if anybody actually studies or tracks the population of bobcats. Uh, I know the range is a lot smaller, so they're a lot more widespread. Um, they're all throughout North America and northern Mexico. So. One right over the yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. And yeah. Because their range is about five to six miles um, yeah, normally, but it gets smaller if it, they're in an urban area. So, mm -hmm. have you seen them? Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Yeah. And the otter, we got an otter, five babies. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's cool. Yeah. I'm really smarter because I never read about them getting hit by a car, but I always hear about panthers getting hit. Well, bobcats get hit by cars too, but that's not as newsworthy, I guess, as uh, panthers. Endangered. Right, no, I guess, no. So yeah, Florida panthers are endangered species. You know, there's a lot of work done by our agency and by the Fish and Wildlife Service to recover their populations, and so that's why it makes the news when unfortunately they get hit by cars. Who cares about the bobcats? I know, but I probably care about it all though. <laughs> so uh, how can you minimize an interaction? If you, how do you avoid one? Let's get to that part. Panthers being solitary and uh, fearful of humans, the likelihood that you're gonna encounter one is probably pretty small, if none. So, but there are things you can do in, to prevent that from happening, to prevent if you do see one, and what do you do if you do? So be alert from dusk till dawn. They're crepuscular animals, which means they're most active during the sunset and the sunrise hours and the dark hours in between. That does not mean they won't be active during the day or most active during the day too, right? But we, we're up at night, so. Yeah? Crossing the road in no. Imperial Gulf. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's possible. We never say impossible. It's totally possible. Uh, keep panther prey away. Um, don't leave, you know, if you leave food out for cats or dogs or other animals, uh, if you feed wildlife and you attract turkeys and raccoons and, and things to your yard, you are attracting panthers to your yard too. So, and we have a little picture here of a deer eating some landscaping. If you can avoid any deer loving plants, that'll keep the deer from coming to your yard too. Um, that'll be discourage any panther activity on your property. Keep your pets and domestic livestock secure. So anytime that, uh, I usually tell people, of course, between dusk and dawn and all the hours in between, and then when you're not home, because uh, it's still during the daytime, it's, depredations still occur even in, during light hours. Landscape for safety, uh, besides not installing deer-loving plants, if you can put other types of plants there, uh, if, if you startle a panther by coming outside of your house, the first thing they're gonna do look, is look for cover. So if you have a lot of thick vegetation in your home, gonna, that's the first place they're gonna hide. So can try to keep your landscaping clear enough. Don't give them a lot of places to, to be able to hide and get away from you. Um, then you won't, even, you won't even know that they're there. So, but if you keep your landscaping uh, clean and clear, that'll, that'll be helpful a lot. Consider other deterrents like motion lights, uh, loud noises, sometimes sprinklers, things that startle predators are also helpful. And of course, always hike your bike with a friend. It's more fun that way. Besides, it's safer because there's more than panthers out there. So what if you encounter a panther? Well, keep your children and your pets, too, within sight and close to you. So don't let anything run off. Uh, give the panther space. If you give them enough space, they should behave normally um, as a, and walk away from you and go back to wherever they came from or go on their merry way where they were headed. Don't run. We talked about that already. Avoid crouching or bending. You don't want to look smaller. So you don't want to look like you're trying to hide. Uh, what, what you want to do is appear larger. You know, put your arms up. You can scream at it if you're comfortable. It's the one thing, maybe you practice. 
<laughs> so that way you're not scared if it does happen. So, and then fight back if you're attacked. We talked about that. So safety for people and panthers. And this is a little bit about, you know, how do we still encourage um, panther conservation? What can you do on the road since that's k killing a lot of our panthers? Observing the posted speed limits uh, is one of them. And you'll notice that some places around the county, we have areas where you should be driving slower at night. And that's because it gives you and the animals more reaction time. Uh, you'll also notice signs that says panther crossing. We do have panthers crossing those roads. So whatever you can do to slow down in those areas. And if you know of panthers being killed on a particular road that you're traveling, if you'll slow down in those areas too, we greatly appreciate it. It gives you both time to react in case you see one and they see you. Spend an extra minute. Um, what that means is if you reduce your speed from 60 miles per hour to 45 miles per hour in a three mile stretch of road, you will only have lost one minute of travel time. But you may save a lot of you may save a lot of damage to yourself or injury to yourself by not hitting and the panther as well by slowing down in those areas where you are most likely to encounter not just panthers but other wildlife. It's never fun to hit animals in the road. And be aware when driving. So I have a picture there of a raccoon. You can see that its eyes are shining back in the reflection of the light. And so you can observe that on the side of the road. Then you know that there's an animal there or in the road. Uh, you slow down, give you both an opportunity to increase your reaction time. And if you're looking down a road and you see a lot of reflectors, but then there's one that you know should be there and isn't, probably means an animal has moved between your vehicle uh, and the reflectors. So slow down, you know, give you both an opportunity. And then just be aware when driving, you know, what's around you, what's on the side of the road. I'm always extra cautious when I see deer on the side of the road uh, or other animals. And one thing I'll add too is don't throw your food out the window. Food's biodegradable, but then now it's going to attract panther prey to the side of the road, which is never good for panthers. So we have a lot of neighbors and partners uh, that help us out. So the Conservative Southwest Florida, of course, one of our partners and our neighbors. Uh, they help out with the pen assistance, but they also, for smaller livestock, uh, commercial livestock operations, they have some reimbursement programs available there, and they do a lot of education as well. Um, they have a, they have been having a, a campaign lately, and they've had some panthers featured in that. The F-Stop Foundation provides us a lot of pictures. The Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida, if you're interested in trying to support some panther efforts, uh, you can always contact them. Uh, picture on the left, bottom left, that's Uno, who lives now lives at the Naples Zoo. You yeah, know, was shot in the face with birdshot, unfortunately. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, yeah, that's unfortunate. So it's usually why I try to bring, you know, my taxidermied animals, because the likelihood of you getting to see a panther is usually fairly small, unless you go to the zoo. That's what I was saying today. But even then, yeah. There's so much vegetation in there. You can't see them. Right. And, and with panthers being most active, you know, crepuscular animals, yeah, you're sleeping during the day. Plus, it's really hot, so he doesn't want to move around right now. Um, the we, home Assassa, we've got a couple of panthers in captivity up there. We only have a few panthers in captivity, and that's because they're injured and can no longer live in the wild for most, uh, for most of them. Uh, the Wings of Hope, Panther Posse, I don't know if you guys have heard of that group. Uh, it's operated off the campus of FGCU, and they educate between three and 4,000 fourth and fifth grade students every year. Uh, they, in the fall, they bring them to a classroom there on the, at the university, and they learn about panther habitat. Uh, they learn about research, the kittens, the biology, um, and the panther prey. And then in the spring, they go hiking through Crew, the Corkscrew Regional Ecosystem Watershed at the Marsh Trails. Have you guys ever been out there? It's a pretty neat space. Well, they hike them through panther habitat. When you're walking through there, that's, that's a space panthers utilize so that they're educating kids about that. If you need more information, you can always check our website, myfwc.com backslash panther. We have a lot of information available for you there. Some of the reports, um, if you want to look at you know, different graph material, you want to keep up with uh, mortalities, if we've discovered any births of kittens and that kind of thing, uh, you can always check that out. And citizen science. So the panther team is really small. So to collect panther data, we also rely on people to help us do that. And we've got a mechanism where you can report tracks pictures of sharks, and photographic evidence that you could submit if you think you've taken a picture of a panther. You can visit our website to do that. And now I guess we're ready for questions. So. Are, are auto uh, car, car panther interactions usually fatal? 
from what we know, it, it typically we're recovering um, a deceased carcass of a panther, and they're being hit, you know, between during the sunset hours or at night, and we often don't know about it until the next day because most people don't stop to look to see what they hid. Um, of course, go ahead. Where, where is the uh, worst road for panther uh, panther being hit and killed on the roads? The worst one. <laughs> Well, you know, there's some place that's really bad, like 20 is 29 over there bad. 29 is not, not a good place. The Mockley Roads seem, seem to be an issue lately. Um, 41, yeah, we've, you know, we've had panthers sit out in the Golden Gate, some of the roads off Golden Gate Estates. So, um, because the main um, population densities in Collier and Eastern Collier, that's any of those travel lanes, where they're yeah. traveling. So, how many panthers are there? What's the estimated count uh, today in uh, Florida? Yeah, so the low number is 120, and they, but there could be as many as 230. 120. Yeah. And, and, and the range that you have designated for them, mm -hmm. how many can that really support given their territorial needs? Yeah, I've had that question before. Um, and that's something, you know, we look at the public lands and we use that, that to help estimate the number of panthers. And so that's where we start to get into the high end of the number. Um, but, you know, considering panther behavior and habitat and the fact that they don't just utilize public space. Yeah, so it's, it, it will, I suppose time will tell too on how much more development occurs. You know, make sure land can be set aside. So each year, a number of them are killed by cars mm -hmm. and, and, and other wildlife, probably uh, predators as well. Maybe bigger various predators for, uh, for uh, panthers? No. No, they aren't. Do they have any other, uh, do they have any other animal predators? Alligators. No. So as far as interactions between, you mean panthers and alligators or panthers and bears? So yeah, so what we're finding when we recover most panthers, it's vehicles, but they also, uh, we call intraspecific aggression, which is when a panther's killed another panther. So yeah, so that's, that's the other factor. Uh, we, right now we've got 13 collared panthers. Um, so that's 10 that Florida Fish and Wildlife has collared, and then Big Cypress National Preserve runs their own collaring program, and they have three. So, and then uh, those are monitored every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday by flights from the biology team with FWC. Yeah, it's a good question. Yes. Um, <coughs> oh. I thought I saw the, the slide said that the, the females pregnant for only three months, mm -hmm. and then they have two or three kids. Right. So they could produce a lot of offspring in a year's time, right? Well, she's not going to reproduce typically until she's raised her young, though. So she, once she's had the gestation, she's given birth, and it's going to be that nine month to a year and a half period before her kittens depart, before she um, mates, usually. That's a question. Who would we call, or what number, if we spotted like a dead panther along the side of the road? Oh, yeah, so I have the number on my card, so make sure you get a card for me from me before you leave. Yes, so I feel like that's always important. And if you, if you think, if you've hit a panther, you know, you, you pretty much, you would know it because it's a pretty large animal. Um, you know, call us then too, because sometimes I get the question about, is it illegal to hit panthers with a car? I'm like, well, I'm, nobody does it on purpose, I'm sure. Uh, I can't explain what you're doing with your other activities while you're driving, but no. So we always encourage people to call because that's an opportunity for us to recover the cats if we can. So, and we've been able to do that a couple times recently, so. Has a, has a vehicle panther interaction ever resulted in uh, human fatalities? Do they, uh, you know, stare into a tree or something? Or <laughs> okay, not that I'm aware of. of. No, okay, so it's a, yeah. a one-sided deal. No, but it has it resulted in some serious damage to the vehicle? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, yes. So, yeah. My daughter, so weird, though. <laughs> my dog hit a deer once. You know, I, I, I lost a lot of that Bambi love <laughs> after that. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. But you know what? She can use the same tips that we go over for, you know, watching out for wildlife in the roadway. For, that's, that's good for anything, not just panthers. So, yeah, cool. If you hit one and it's still alive. Well, don't approach it. No. Do, do call, you know, and, and that way the, um, the number goes to dispatch and they'll contact one of, our, uh, one of the members of our team, one of the biologists, and then they'll, and the veterinarian, and they'll do what they can to recover it. Don't pick it up and put it in your bag. In your trunk. <laughs> no, definitely do not do that. Let the professionals handle it. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> but that's a good question. All right. Seems like most of the incidents I hear about are involve trucks. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't heard that or seen that specifically. Yeah. So. And the, this may go beyond your uh, expertise, but the gestation yeah. period struck me as rather brief. Is mm -hmm. that characteristic out there, or how does that compare with other species? Oh, how does it compare with other species? <laughs> Yeah, I suppose it depends. There's a, a different factors that go into it. But I have a little plush kitten on the table, and they, they're pretty small. They're only about two pounds. So you can give them life expectancy and other factors. But I'm not sure. That, that would be something that I'll have to compare to other, other things. Well think, about, think about, well, think about birds. You know, birds lay an egg, and a couple weeks it hatches, and then a couple months or, or shorter, they leave the nest. So birds are, birds are quick. So it seems that you know, it's going to be dependent on the species. Yeah, pretty Is good question. Is there any evidence of, of the males eating the cubs of another male, like the lions do? Eating? No. Um, attacking, I suppose. Killing. Yeah, I don't know that we were. That's yeah. Because feral cats will. Yeah. Yeah, feral cats. Yeah. So when we talk about intraspecific aggression, I mean it can be male on male. Sometimes it's male on female. Um, so you know, or male on kittens because. Lions will eat another. Lions offspring because mm -hmm. they don't want, you know, their rivals' offspring to survive. So, yeah. any evidence of that? I, from what I would understand, I don't think it's so much about that. If the males are attacking other males, it's going to be a territorial issue. Uh, males that are maybe attacking kittens, it's going to be an issue of that they may want to mate with the female, and mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah, they don't operate the, quite the same way as lions because lions operate in a pride, so it's a little bit different. How long do the collars last? Do they get replaced? Yes, yes. If they, they typically are, should last about two years. So they don't always, but they're this supposed to. And yes, then they, they get replaced. So because you can find those guys. So, okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Oh, we got one more question. Can you talk about the comfort level of water? I mean, when I, go to, okay. when I go to a big cypress, you know, there's, you just look out and there's just so much water around. And I'm sure mm -hmm. they try to stay probably dry as much as possible, though, with such a large foraging area. Right. Surely they have to encounter various depths depending on time of year, rainfall, and so on. So, I sure. Mean, and the big lakes, do they, if they're comfortable enough with shallower, or they have they been known to swim lakes and try to find and foraging and so on anyway? But how comfortable are they with water living around water? Yeah, they can swim through water, no problem. Mm -hmm. So, just try to avoid it. Very they don't want to live in it, you know. They, um, yeah, I suppose whenever they can avoid it, they will. Um, and if they're going to swim through it, they're probably trying to swim from one dry section to another one. So, but that's we talked about the Clusatchee River. You know, that's one of the things that's come up. We don't know how the females may have gotten north of the river, but that may be one of the possibilities is, is that they swam. So, yeah. So yeah, they're not afraid of water, but they they're not going to want to stay in the water. But their ranges are pretty large, so you th they're just going to find another dry area of their range if they can. So, that's a good question. I, I went to One more? Path of Fest that were held up at the regional, North Regional Park there. Okay, there yeah. The last year or two. Uh, yeah. Is that going to come back someday? Yeah, so it was on hiatus for 2015. In 2016, the Naples Zoo became the new sponsor. Oh, yes, that's right. Yep, so, so this, yep, on November 4th, I believe, should be coming up at the Naples Zoo, which is, it's the first Saturday of the month, which is free to call your residents. So yeah, I encourage you guys to come visit. I'll be there. Well, there we'll look for you. Good, thank you. All right, looks like we're about to wrap it up. I have a lot of materials and I'll be available a little bit afterward for any questions.